Good morning. Good morning. Whoa. Well, welcome to Trinity Baptist Church. We're delighted to have you joining us this morning as uh, we're going to be opening the Word together and uh, praising Jesus. And for those of you at home, welcome. We're delighted to have you joining our service on live stream. Thank you for spending this time with us. We're going to have a wonderful time today, uh, opening God's Word, and just want to welcome you and uh, hope you're all doing well. Uh, I've got a word from Pastor Daryl and Amy and Lydia and Ethan and Maddie. They are all well. They're doing really good. They will be all be back next Sunday. Uh, they will be here and ready to go and lead us, and we can't wait to see them again. Uh, especially, I can't wait to see the grandchildren again. And uh, so, it, But they're doing really well, really good. They're all healthy. They, can't, they only had mild cases of this. And they're doing doing great, and it's exciting to to know that they'll be back next Sunday. This uh, so to let you know, this week the church is really not uh, we're not doing anything until next Sunday. Wednesday night is we are not having any programs Wednesday night, uh, but there will be next Sunday. And the next Sunday after that, then we open up uh, the regular programs again. Okay. Uh, there is another announcement. Uh, remember the Operation Christmas Child. Okay, we are, as a church, we are going to do Operation Christmas Child. Carol and I are leading that. We talked to people last week, and we ordered yesterday. And so here's how that's going to work. And by the way, children, these families and children need help more than ever now. And they need hope more than ever. And this is a way for us to help give them help and hope. Uh, so what we're going to do is, those of you at church here, uh, Start thinking the pickup date is uh, going to be November 15th or 16th, something like that. 15th. Uh, I will, we will give you better information as we go along. We've just now gotten into this. But uh, those of you at church will pass out boxes. We'll give you information, and uh, then we will bring the boxes back like we normally do. For those of you at home that want to be involved in this, if you want to, we want you to be involved in this. Carol, if you let us know, Carol and I will bring you a box or boxes, whatever you want. And then when it comes to pickup, we will get in touch with you about, and we will come to your house and we will pick up things. We will come with masks on and we will do social distancing. You may have to put them on the porch, but we will do all of that. Uh, we will stick to the guidelines. Um, we're, that's important. Okay, but uh, we're excited because we're going to be a part of this uh, Operation Christmas Child. So I want to we want to tell you about that and get you to start thinking toward that end, okay? All right. Uh, I don't think there are any more announcements. Patrick, any more announcements? Are we good? Okay. That's not an announcement. <laughs> the, the, the question was, he said the Padres, and I said, that's good luck. How's that? <laughs> Anyway, okay, uh, this morning, now we, uh, we again, it, it's a little harder, but we will not be uh, worshiping this morning, but we will be in the Word of God, and uh, what, what happened was, you know, I had, I had two weeks to get ready for this, so I, I, I got a sermon ready, and then yesterday, uh, so whatever title is in the out and the bulletin is wrong because uh, I, I, God had something else that, that put on my mind yesterday. So yesterday, last night and this morning, we've got a new sermon, okay? So, uh, and I was told by Patrick that since we don't have any, uh, we don't have worship this morning, that I have plenty of time to finish my sermon, now, nervous laughter, I knew they'd get a reaction out of you there because you'd probably vote with your feet if I did something like that. But anyway, all right, I, I'm, I'm excited about today. I'm excited especially about next Sunday having uh, our pastor back and, and Amy and all the kids and the worship. And it's really, really exciting. And uh, just praise God for, for them. Keep praying for them. And everybody else that is home, uh, keep praying for them. And uh, we just are... Uh, delighted that you can join us on uh, 
on the live stream, okay? Well, let's bow for a word of prayer and then we'll get into the word, all right? Let's pray. Father, I just pray now that you would come and move in power this morning. Lord, uh, we know that uh, you, we are your people and we want, to, uh, we want to be people who trust you. And we want to know, uh, we want to know, know more about you. And Lord, we, we know that nothing catches you by surprise. And so, Lord, we ask that you would come and take our focus, take our attention, Lord, uh, off things that might want to distract us. And we want to put our eyes on you, Lord. Would you minister your presence to us this morning? Would you you come in all your power into each home that's watching this? Would you come by the presence and power of your Holy Spirit? Would you come and speak to our hearts? Would you open our hearts and minds? Would you move in power today, Lord? And so we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, okay, if you have your Bibles, I want you to open them to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. And uh, I want to start with a true story. How's that? about a guy, a man named Larry, who lived in Southern California. Uh, Larry went to an Army-Navy surplus store. He bought 75 used weather balloons. He inflated them with helium. He attached them to a lawn chair he had secured to the back of his pickup truck. And with several friends watching, he climbed into the lawn chair, settled in, and had a friend untie the rope. He was hoping, according to a friend, to see the neighborhood from a different angle and gain a new perspective on his life. Obviously, this is before drones, right? Okay. He took nothing with him, but here's what he took. A peanut butter sandwich, a six-pack of beer, and a fully loaded BB gun. Two and a half hours later, the Los Angeles International Airport reported an unidentified flying object above the sky at LAX at nearly 16,000 feet. Lawn chair Larry, I guess you can call him, the reclining astronaut was now three miles into the sky and 100 miles from his original launch site. The pilot of the 737 who first spotted Larry said, I see what looks like a perfectly still man reclining in a lawn chair, and I think he's holding a rifle. So SWAT teams kind of lassoed Larry. They got got him, and uh, by the course of time, of course, he had passed out in the chair, and they ferried him safely back to the ground. He actually got him back safely. Just in case you're interested, his intentions, he said, were to safely saunter up to the right altitude, then use his BB gun to shoot out some of the balloons to keep him where he wanted to be, and then ultimately shoot them all out one at a time as he settled kind of safely, slowly back down to earth. However, when he untied himself from the pickup, his friends said he shot up into the air like he was shot out of a cannon. So... He panicked, and he did the only thing he knew how to do in a stressful situation. He broke open the six-pack of beer, and he started drinking. Uh, At 2,000 feet, he passed out. On the ground, after being revived back to consciousness, Larry was interviewed by a local reporter who asked him three questions. Uh, Larry, were you scared? He said, yes. Actually, he said a lot more than that, but I can't tell you because we're in church. Larry, would you do it again? He said, no. He's a quick learner, huh? And the last question, why'd you do it? To which he replied, I just got tired of always sitting around. Well, during this pandemic, haven't haven't you got tired of just sitting around, doing the same thing day after day? You know, uh, one of the neat things about listening to Daryl preach is is he's been taking us through the book of Romans. I've, I've told you the last couple of times I've preached, but I felt like I was being challenged. And I've been challenged to, uh, to, to question what my walk with Christ really looks like and what, it's been do- what I've been doing. And, uh, and, so, and I'm here to tell you, we can no longer sit around the way we always used to do. Uh, we need to stand up and be what God wants us to be. Amen? And to do that, we have to surrender completely to Jesus. So, Let's, uh, let's get into, with that in mind, let's get into Ephesians chapter 3. And uh, let me start this way. Not long ago, I, uh, well, just the other day, since it's been so hot, uh, Carol and I have been, we have to water the flowers in the, back, in the back a lot, right? 
So we get the, you get the hose all pulled out, and you get it going around, and you, then you go back and turn on the water, and you turn on the spigot. I went over and turned on the spigot, and everything was great until I got a kink in the hose. Anybody know what that's like? Yep. You know, uh, well, being this red-blooded American man that I am, uh, I did what all men do. Rather than putting down the nozzle and fixing the kink, I start flipping the hose up and down. Anybody do that? That's what, that's what we do, right? Well, it didn't work, so you know what I did? I just pulled it harder and shook it harder, right? Still didn't work. And again, rather than setting down the nozzle, what I did is I started pressing harder in it. Now, Carol's good because Carol goes back and goes to the kink and unkinks it and, you know, and, and increases the pressure. But I was just getting kind of a fizzle coming out of the end and, until I finally wore down and went, you know, but, but I kept doing that. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, okay. Well, I thought about that during my preparation this, uh, this week. Well, actually, yesterday. <laughs> Is, uh, we kind of get spiritual, our spiritual lives get kinks in them. And during... Uh, and we get kinks in our spiritual hose at, at some point in time. And, and the list that causes kinks is, you know, long. A tragedy can occur. Uh, difficulties come. Coronavirus comes into our lives, right? Uh, we get disappointed. Anybody been disappointed during this time? We get disappointed in ourselves. We get disappointed in God. We get disappointed in our circumstances. We get fed up. We commit a sin. And we get all kinked up. Someone sins against us, causes a kink. A church leader lets you down, disappoints you, causes a kink. The church fails to be the church. It develops a kink. And the flow out of our lives is, is not what it should be. But rather than going back and dealing with the kink, more often than not, what we tend to do is we tend to just shake the hose harder and harder. And we do more and we press harder, need to be better. And we need to do more and we need to press harder. And maybe that will change something. And guess what? It never does. And the biggest tragedy is you get a kink in your spiritual hose, and after a while, you get tired of shaking it and trying harder and all. And what do you do? You finally just quit pressing on it and give up. And so you say, well, here's the danger. We say, well, I guess that's normal. Maybe I'm not supposed to experience this deep sense of connection between me and the Lord. And on, maybe I'm not supposed to, maybe really is, I really don't have or will have that sense of peace or this awareness of his presence every time, every, all day in what I'm going through. And the sense that he's with me all the time. Maybe it's just normal to have kind of a drizzle in our spiritual lives. Anybody relate to what I'm talking about? Well, if you've been through a time like that, and I tell you probably, since March 13th, we've all been through that, right? Well, if you've been through a time like that, I'll tell you, a lot of other people go through that as well. As a matter of fact, some other people, some ancient people, went through it, and the Apostle Paul wrote to them on how to, how to move behind, beyond it, all right? Let me show you. If you have your Bibles open now, let's look at Ephesians chapter 3. And we're looking this morning at deepening of our spiritual lives with Christ. Now, as you're finding your... Uh, places we're getting getting to the let me give you some context we know this letter we have in our bible called ephesians was written by the apostle paul he's under house arrest and he's in rome for allegedly inciting a riot in ancient jerusalem well after he gets arrested after he gets taken to rome the people in ephesus the church there that paul founded and taught there they became really concerned so much so that they became they became discouraged so uh, they became discouraged. They became disheartened over what was happening to Paul. So he wrote to them. Look at Notice chapter 3, look at verse 13. And this will set our context And then, uh, as we go on into the study. Paul wrote verse 13. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. So obviously there's a kink in their spiritual hose, right? They're, they were at a point, as the King James translates this, that they were at the point of fading. That's what the King James talked about. It means the point of giving up, of being overwhelmed. And he'd been, but he'd been overwhelmed these last six, seven months? 
If this could happen, and so they start thinking, if this could happen to the Apostle Paul, it can happen to us. Why would God allow the great apostle to go through this kind of pain and this kind of imprisonment? <coughs> they didn't get it. There was a kink in their hose. Well, obviously, Paul didn't want them to be like that. So Paul did the one thing he could do from a thousand miles away. He started praying for them. Okay? He actually wrote down his prayer for us. Look at verse 14. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, with even a, just a cursory reading of that prayer, it's clear that Paul didn't want them to maintain a kink in their spiritual hose, right? He, wanted them, he wants them to experience all that God had planned for them in their spiritual lives. And as we dig into this prayer, we're going to see, here we're, what we're going to see is five needs that the Ephesians had that if fulfilled, it would unleash the kink. Five needs that you and I have. So, if you're taking notes, I'll give them to you as we go, right? Uh, if you've got a kink in your spiritual holes, you need, uh, you know who you are, five needs. The good news is God wants to meet those needs in your life. Now, the text is pretty clear. God's calling us beyond this kind of drizzle experience with him to a deeper walk with him. Now, to get there, first, you're gonna, here's the first thing you're going to need. You're going to need to be strengthened from within. You're going to need to be strengthened within, all right? You need a renewed strength. That's the first thing. Look at verse 16. He asked for them to be strengthened with power through his spirit in what? Your inner being. Now, we're very familiar with, uh, with the outer person. We dress it up. We, we shave. We primp it. We put cream all over it, right? We, and that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, nothing wrong with dealing with the outer person. Most of the kinks, though, come from the inner person. And uh, some people see the inner being as the soul, some see it as the spirit. For, for our sake today, let's just call it the heart, all right? The heart. Uh, it's the command center of our lives. Uh, it's the part within us that gets discouraged. Anybody know about discouragement? You know? where we become despairing, where we get overwhelmed, where we don't know what to do, where we get confused, we get angry, we get frustrated, we get, a, we get out of sorts, you know? We get kinks, and it tends to come from that inner being. And uh, we are seeing a new, fresh, fresh vision of that with the coronavirus. Uh, this is the worst tragedy, in, in my experience, that I've ever seen, you know? Until uh, uh, before this, it was nine nine eleven was the worst tragedy I saw. Now now it's something called the coronavirus that hit us. Where do you go when you're absolutely overwhelmed? Where when you don't have the resources to deal with a problem? Uh, you know where do you go when you run out of resources to deal with these kinks in life? Well, the constant teaching. Listen, the constant teaching of God's word is to, is to this: run to God, run to the Lord. You are not going to hear the Bible say to you, look within yourself for power. That's what the bestsellers and the, if you go to the bookstores talk about. But you're not going to hear the Bible say, pull, your up, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You are going to hear the Bible say something like this. You're going to hear the Bible say, run to the Lord. All right? You, uh, you run to the Lord. And because you don't have the strength to deal with this, but God says, I do. And that's why Paul says in verse 16 that they would be strengthened. He says, verse 16, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power. Now, in the Greek, it's in the passive voice. We don't strengthen ourselves. God strengthens us in our innermost being. So if you've got a kink within, you are discouraged, you're disheartened, you're out of hope, you're overwhelmed, you are frustrated, look to the Lord. All right, look to the Lord because he's got plenty of resources. That's why Paul prays out of whose glorious riches? His, out of God's glorious riches. 
That's why Paul prays that. How do you, now listen, how rich do you think God is? He's not going to run out of resources, is he? And this is where you and I need help. My guess is that if you looked at your prayer requests over the past year, especially, I would say even especially since the lockdown started, not many of you have to do, uh, your prayer requests have to do with the outer person. But where most of us really need help is in the inner person. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. I get worried. I am impatient. Anybody know about that? I get worried. I am impatient. I get afraid. I'm angry at times. So, Lord, I need your transforming work in my innermost being. That's where my kinks come from. And the coronavirus, listen, the coronavirus, the political climate, the social unrest, the economy, lockdowns, you know, uh, all, you know, all these heighten our feelings. Anybody else like that? You know? In our relationships, one thing you will hear this morning, in, in all these needs being met, God is calling you and me to a deeper walk with Him. Uh, you need to know something. A kinked hose in our spiritual life is not normal. It's not normal. We start to think, and the problem is we start to think it's normal. Something is wrong, so we just try harder. Shake the hose, you know? <coughs> That is not. That is no way to uh, water your plants. It's no way to live a spiritual life either. Lord, give me strength within. Help me deal with the kinks within. Okay, that's first. Number two. Here's number two. In order to really get there, it's going to require your wholehearted submission to Jesus Christ. And that was Paul's prayer. Look at verse 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, you need to know something. When he says when, when you, uh, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, he, now he is not praying that they would become Christians. They were already followers of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. They had believed in the Lord. The Holy Spirit had already taken up residence in their lives. The prayer that was, Jesus, uh, that was, was that Jesus would be home, at home in every dimension of their lives, that he would be in control of every dimension of their lives. That's what the verb in the Greek means, dwell means. It means that Jesus has full access, that he is comfortable in every dimension of your heart and your life. That's the prayer here, that Jesus would have full access. (coughs) Paul went to God in prayer that these great truths, these great truths he's talking about and praying about, might become a reality in the lives of these believers. But it's exactly here that one of the biggest kinks in our spiritual lives and a Christian's experience happens. Because we lock Jesus out of certain areas of our life. Jesus, you're really good in the spiritual part. But you know, when it comes to work, I'm the expert. When it comes to play, I'm the expert. When it comes to dealing with my family, I'm the expert. Whatever. Uh, so, so who, who's in control? You or Jesus? Or, Jesus, you'd be embarrassed by the movies that I'm watching tonight. Uh, I'm going to lock you out of my living room tonight. Oh, Lord, the language I use at work, you wouldn't like it. I'm going to lock you out of my office. Uh, Jesus, you might be embarrassed by the way I act with my friends. I'm going to lock you out of that part. These are all kinks in our spiritual hose. Paul prays, Lord, would you please be at home in every dimension, in every room of every heart and life? Because until you get there, you are not going to live the Christian life the way God intended you to live. We just kind of, we, we just kind of put up with it. And we think it's normal. Listen, the, we are hearing, we are being pulled with a lot of voices giving us information about how we should live from society. And these voices are vying for control of our lives and what we learn. So we're hearing from this and we're hearing from that. My question is, what voice are you listening to? We've got to focus those other voices and push them aside and we've got to focus on one thing and here it is. We've got to focus on God's Word. Amen? That's where we're going to get the strength. That's where we're going to get the guidance. And that's what we're going to, uh, we're going to grow in this walk with Him. Now, <clears throat> does that mean we don't ever sin? No. Does that mean we don't struggle? No. Does that mean we don't have times when we get up in the morning and we're just down or discouraged? No. We're human beings and we struggle with this. 
And, and God knows it. But when we, we sin, we, ask for, we confess and ask for, for help. When we're struggling, we tell God we're struggling. We need, we need you to help us. You know? Uh, God's calling us beyond this uh, to deepen our spiritual lives, beyond the status quo, beyond the things that we experienced up to this point in time. And it's me, you, individually, corporately, if, if you've been playing at this walk with Christ, if you've just been half-hearted, you've been watering your plants like this with a drizzle, you know, you need to do more than just shake the hose. You need to give yourself totally over to Jesus Christ. In, I don't know if you, well, I know, probably you know this, but listen, it's a good reminder. In the New Testament, there are three possible heart temperatures. Did you know that? First, there is Matthew 24, 12. Heart. First, there is the cold heart, Matthew 24, 12. It describes the people of the last days as those whose love for God shall wax cold. Then, in Revelation chapter 3, we read of those whose hearts are lukewarm. It's the church at Laodicea. And uh, he says, God says, I wish you were either one or the other. I wish you were hot or cold. But you're not. You are what? Lukewarm. And he says, because of that, I want to spit you out of my mouth. So we've got cold hearts. We've got lukewarm hearts. But then finally, there is this burning heart. Luke 24, 32. Tell, it tells of two disciples who talked with Jesus on the road to Emmaus. <clears throat> they, had, they had been leaving Jerusalem. And they described their experience like this. Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the what to us? The scriptures to us. So there's a cold heart, a lukewarm heart, and there's a burning heart. The question we each have to ask is, which one are we? God is calling you and me beyond half-heartedness to a renewed strength, to a wholehearted submission to him. And that's what he wants. Now, we don't, all, we don't do that every day, but that's the goal. All right? Now, here's the third thing. We need to understand, have more clarity and really understand God's unconditional love. And when we do, this then becomes the heart of our motivation of everything we do. Paul's prayer, look at verse 17. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in what? Love. Stop there just for a moment. Paul is talking about the experience of every believer in Christ at the moment of salvation. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, say amen. At the moment you believed, now listen to this, at the moment you believed, you were, using a horticultural analogy, you were rooted in the love of Christ, Paul says. The roots of your salvation go down deep into that love. And then Paul, he abruptly changes analogies to an architectural one. The moment that you believed, you were, he says, you were rooted in that love, and then you were also built on the solid foundation of God's love for you in Christ Jesus. Now get this. Paul's whole point using these two analogies, is to say that love will never be diminished. Isn't that good news? And the reason we know that is Paul uses a very specialized Greek tense here for these participles. He said, see where it says rooted and established? Perfect passive participle in the Greek. Okay? What it communicates is that we were rooted in love in the past, we are rooted in love right now, and we will be rooted in love for all eternity. The moment you believed, you were established in that love in the past, you are established in that love right now, and you will always and forever be established in that love. Now listen, what it means is nothing can ever change that. Nothing. Time and again the Scriptures repeat this. Romans 5.5 5 says this. God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. We've experienced this love. This is what we know. But now everybody, but not everybody grasps this. And that's Paul's prayer. Verse 18, I pray that you may have power together with all the saints to grasp literally, it said, where it says grasp, in the Greek, the literally says to, verb is to seize. To seize. 
Paul is praying, Lord, would you allow these Ephesians to grab hold of this truth? This is such an important truth. And he says, I want you to grab hold of this truth. I want you to be captured by the truth that God loves them. How many of you know God loves you? How many of you worry about that sometimes? We all do. To be captured by that truth that God loves you. Paul prays, I pray these Ephesians, I pray those people down in Poway, when, when they, they hear this and they read this, I pray that they would be just grabbed by this, that I love them and that will never change. To grasp, verse 18 continues, look at it. How wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Each one of these is describing God's love for his children. It's so wide, it includes male and female, young and old, educated and uneducated, brown and black, red and white, Asian, and every other color under the sun. It's for everyone. It's that wide. It's that long. It will, it's so long, it will go from eternity past to eternity future. It's so deep, it will reach down to the worst sinner who ever lived. It's so high that it will carry that sinner to the highest place in heaven. And this is why time and again throughout the scriptures, Paul simply asks a question. Verse Romans 8.35, he asks this, Who is going to separate us from that love? And his answer, <laughs> no one, nothing. And he goes through a whole litany of things. Nothing can separate us from that love. And he says, nothing. We are rooted in that love. We are established in that love. And Paul, turn back to Ephesians 1.3. Look at that. Paul says in Ephesians 1.3, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And it's precisely here where one of, we get one of our biggest problems. God couldn't love me that way. Why? Because I'm really messed up. I've failed. Anybody failed? Yeah. If he really knew what was going on in my life, he, he, he wouldn't love me like that. And there are a lot of people who believe that lie. I don't know about you, but when, when I make a stupid mistake, I have a tendency to beat myself up. Anybody else? Aren't that? Why, you know, here's the questions I ask. Like, why are you such an idiot? Uh, it's a kink. And God is calling us beyond that. He doesn't want those lies to be in our minds and our hearts. So Paul prays to strengthen them in the inner being so they will give, so they give a wholehearted commitment to the Lord. He says, I want them to know how much you love them so they'll in turn give themselves totally over to you. And he prays, would you stabilize them with a, con a clarity about God's unconditional love? May they seize it. May they grasp it. May they know it. Because God wants us to go beyond just that message of love in our heads. He wants to get that message of love down into our soul and our heart. Because if it gets into there, guess what? It's going to transform us. And that brings us to the fourth need. Here's number four. We need a soul or a life transforming experience. And that's why Paul prays, look at verse 19, that they may know this love that surpasses knowledge. He wants us to know something. Now, know is a relational word. He's not talking about grasping an intellectual idea that's out here. And uh, he, wants us, he wants this love to absolutely transform us from within in a way that it actually surpasses our knowledge. Dr. Tim Keller was right when he wrote this. We must not settle for an informed mind without an engaged heart. If Listen, if we're not experiencing the love of God, that is not normal. Something is wrong. There's a kink. And it doesn't matter how long you have known the Lord either. It doesn't matter if you've known Him for 60 years. God has something new and fresh for you and me every day. He's calling us beyond this surface stuff to go deeper with Him. <coughs> what I've learned during this, this pandemic, okay, is I've learned that I can't, I can't you, you can't just walk around, walk around on the surface things. You know that story I told you about Larry and his, you know, that crazy guy that went up in his, his uh, helium balloon thing? He, he said he wanted to see life, his neighborhood, from a different angle. 
the pandemic has made me see my walk with Christ from a different angle. And if we're honest, it's, it should be a time when, you know, I think God's crashing down our idols. I think he's tearing down our idols. I mean, think about it. What, during this time, what do we have that, uh, that's better than God? What do we have that even sticks around like God does? God says, Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. The only, the only thing that makes sense to me during this whole pandemic is Jesus Christ. That's it. Everything else is falling by the wayside. You can't trust it. Where's your hope? Is it in the government? Is it in politicians? Even our friends. You know, because we can't always be there for everybody and each other. And we let each other down at times. We shouldn't, but we do because we're human. But we do need each other. But listen, what we need more than anything is a deeper walk with Christ. So this week, I'd like for you to do something. I want you to take this passage in Ephesians chapter 3 that we're looking at, and I want you to read through this prayer every day, once a day for every day for a week. And I want you to listen to the Word of God very carefully. Because what I think you're going to hear as you read through this is God saying, I love you. I love you. You know what came to my mind? When I was a kid, I was taught a really neat song that you all know. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. We can do older ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong, you know. Or little ones to him belong. Jesus, listen, think of this. Jesus descended in the very lowest parts of the earth for you. He was separated from the Father for you. He went to a cross for you. He, not because you were good or how deserving, he did it because he loves you. And when that truth gets into your soul, it changes everything. And as a result of that internal change, then we start to develop a consuming passion and purpose for our lives. And Paul ends with, look at verse 19, with that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. He, does that mean he wants, does, does he say, I, I pray that you'll be filled with a drizzle from that hose that's got kinks in it, that just barely kind of goes? No, he says, he doesn't want the drizzle in your life. He wants God's fullness in your life. We've been, listen, we've been living too long on the drizzle. Isn't that true? He wants fullness in your life. So here's my prayer. Here's my prayer for all of us. Fill us up, Lord. Fill us up. The context here, this filling up is the prominence of his rule. The context is in the rule and reign in our lives. His rule and reign in our lives. That's his purpose, you know? And, and the reason is because his purpose then becomes our purpose. Think of this, at work, at home, locked down, quarantined, all that stuff, right? At school, at our, at money, at our way we think with our money. Everything, it means every part of our lives consumed by Christ Jesus. Yes, the Lord wants to take us beyond what we are experiencing now. But here's something you need to really remember, all right? We don't go there ourselves. He takes us there. It's got to be him. He takes us there. Can he do it? That's the question. Well, Paul concludes with this marvelous benediction. Listen to this. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that has worked within us. If you know, I wish Amy was here and the kids were here right now because this would be the time when you pulled out all the, you, you got an orchestra. I wish Dave Rios was here. I wish, you know, they all had all the instruments and I wish they had drums and they'd be singing and all. And this is where all the instruments would go and race to a crescendo and our voices would go to a crescendo. And as, as Paul pulls out, he says, now to him who is immeasurably more to do, it's able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that has worked within us. He can do it. 
He can do far beyond what you can even think about. Did you know that? One reason we read the Bible is because, listen, you will find in the Bible a God who's bigger than any problem you're going through. Right? God's calling you and me to a deeper spiritual life with Him. He doesn't want you and me to settle for the status quo anymore. Because we, let's be honest with ourselves, we've been settling for far too long. He wants your heart. And he wants your heart to enjoy his presence. Not that you just try harder and work harder, but that you drink deeper of his love. You sit back and you go, man, he died for me. He loves me. Am I worth it? No, but he loves me. So guess what? I'm a child of the king. And so you drink deeper of his love and his care. To go deeper, you got to let God unkink you. It's the only way it's going to change. So you might have to, so here's what you might have to do. You might have to confess a sin or some sins. You might have to let go of, get this, you might have to let go of bitterness. You might have to let go of a disappointment. Some people get angry and they blame God. You have to go to the Lord, ask him for his help, ask for his forgiveness, ask for his grace, and ask for his understanding. And as he give it, gives it, life starts to change. you got to say, God, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. And I'm willing to, to change because I want your best for my life. I'm tired of being in control because it's not working. And as he gives it, life starts to change. And I'm telling you, he will give it. And the normal for our lives starts with this soul transformation that starts with an understanding of his unconditional love. God's calling you and me to a deeper walk with him. And when he starts to make changes in our heart, that's when this doxology concludes. Verse 21, we simply pray, To him be the glory in the church in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Because our God is a soul-transforming God, he doesn't want to leave you the way that you are. He loves you too much to let that happen. <coughs> now, let me close with a true story. Robert Louis Stevenson, in the book he wrote, talked about his son, and his son was on a trip uh, with some other friends, and they were on a cruise, cruise. Line. And they got in the middle of a storm. Well, we're in the middle of a storm with a pandemic, right? They were in the middle of a storm, and his friends got really, and people on the boat were getting pretty upset and worried, fearful for their lives. So Robert Louis Stevenson's boy was with this group of guys, and they asked him, would you go and talk to the captain and find out, if is this ship going down or are we going to make it? So he did. He went to the captain, and then he came back. And they asked him this. The question was, what did he say? Well, here's what Robert Louis Stevenson's son said. He didn't say anything. And they said, what do you mean? He said, I didn't ask him anything. I walked in, and I looked at his face. We're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. See, the deep, when we start to get this deeper walk with Christ, we start looking at the face of Christ. And we stop looking at... Now, it doesn't mean we ignore the things going on around us, but instead of all the chaos around us, we start to focus on the, the person of Jesus Christ. And when you do that, and when you read His Word, it doesn't mean you don't ignore the problems around you. It doesn't mean you don't use wisdom about the things that you're asked to do. It just means that we put our trust in Christ. And then as you look at him and you read his word, you will understand that we are going to be okay. Amen? Let's bow for prayer. Do you need inner strength? Are you worried? Are you ticked off? Well, Lord, help us. Forgive us. Have you been half-hearted in your walk with Christ? Then say, I want to, Lord, I want to be all in with you, Jesus. Have you been clear or have you been questioning God's love? Lord, we want to experience your love. Lord, we want to be consumed by your love and your purpose for our lives. Take us beyond where we are now, Lord. So do your new and fresh good work and draw people to you.
We thank you again for the privilege of studying your word. And uh, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you all that joined us in, uh, in your homes online. And we, uh, we, I ask you to pray this week for Daryl and Amy and the kids and all of us. And we'll see you next week. God bless you. Have a great week.